The scripture reading today will come from Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blame and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to an adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good will of his according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Good morning, brethren and friends. We're happy to see you here. Beautiful Lord's Day morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have on this day to assemble together, to worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and in truth. We have a good number with us, as has already been mentioned, a number of guests with us. We thank you for visiting with us today and hope that you can come back and be with us at any and every opportunity that uh, you might have. And we always enjoy getting to know our church family, people from the community, wherever it may be that uh, you're coming to us from. We're always grateful for this opportunity. And here we are on the last uh, Lord's Day of this month, uh, Lord willing, and uh, it's the end of the week. We'll begin a new month. We'll continue to make our way throughout this year. Continue to give God our very, very best. Let's focus just a moment on Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 7. Thanks to all the men who have led us in our worship uh, this morning. Thankful to Paxton for leading us in our scripture reading. And we're going to take just a moment here. Uh, Paul writing to this church at Ephesus. And I want to notice something that he said in verse 7 as we talk about the scheme of redemption. If you drop back to verse 4, a passage of scripture that has caused much confusion in the world about uh, the world of Christianity that is and, and the loose sense of using that of uh, predestination and uh, nothing you can do to go to heaven or hell. It's uh, all God's choice. Certainly that's not the case. We talked about this last week. Uh, but he had this plan, this plan that, uh, that uh, came about uh, through his son Jesus. That's what we're looking at today, the plan of redemption, the scheme of redemption that God had all of us in mind uh, with this plan so we can go to heaven. Think about verse 7, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. If, if, if you need a verse to become your favorite Bible verse, this is one for consideration. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Think about what he's saying. Scheme of redemption is our lesson. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood. We're not going this direction with our sermon this morning, but tie this into Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, where the Lord purchased the church with his blood and try to come away with the idea that the church isn't important. Redemption is in his blood. His blood purchased the church. That's where redemption is. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. What a beautiful, beautiful thought when you look at these first seven verses of Ephesians chapter 1 and think about God's plan. What I want us to do is go back to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to begin there. We're going to work our way forward. And then we're going to jump into the New Testament. A lot of verses this morning, but you have them. Uh, if you want to take pictures, uh, you can. Uh, or if you want me to provide the outline later, I don't mind doing that. Or if you want to jot them down, as we talk about this scheme of redemption. God shows for you to have life. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Stop and think about that from time to time, especially if perhaps you're maybe thinking, why? Why church? Why God? Why am I doing this? Sometimes we need to stop and go back to the first verse, the first book, first chapter, first verse, first word, and be reminded that we're here only because God chose for us to be here. God chose for us to have life. Everything we have is because God chose to give it to us. When we think about the scheme of redemption, we think about that 
it, it, it is God's beautiful plan, but he had a plan prior to Genesis 1-1, Ephesians 1, 4 through 7, that when man does sin, when man falls away, God said, I'm going to make it possible. You can, you can come back. Later in that chapter, when you get down to verses 26 through 28 of Genesis chapter 1, you see on day 6 of the creation week where God created man. And you get into chapter 2, it's a more detailed account of how God created man and woman on day 6. From the dust of the ground, the dirt of the ground, God created man. And then from his rib, he creates woman. What a, what a beautiful way to begin the story of life and, and this creation of this world. And then, and then you see, when you get to day six, here is God uh, creating man, giving us life. What a, what a joy it is to think about that. So keep in mind that God chose for you to be here. When you get into Genesis chapter three, you see sin entering, but love remains. We see, we see sin entering the, the, the world, but, but you see, you see love, the, the God's love shining through. Open your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. God created man and woman, as you know. And then you get to Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which God had made. And then he said to woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat. The fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. She knew what she was supposed to do. She knew what she was not allowed to do. Adam and Eve knew. They cannot, they cannot stand before God and say, we didn't know. You didn't tell us. They knew what to do. God allowed them to make their own decisions, free will. From the beginning of time, God has always allowed us to make our own decisions. You chose to be here this morning. Some of you, perhaps your parents chose for you to be here, but they're trying to help you to develop your faith for when you get to the point of making decisions like this on your own, then, then you will make the right decisions. I read an article recently, um, I think it was by Don Williams, who worked with the children's home for so many years, and he said something to the effect of, uh, back when his teenage years, uh, in this article, and he said, I'm thankful that my parents made the right decisions for me before I knew how to. Let that sink in a little bit, parents. So, in Genesis chapter 3, Eve is making a decision. Adam will make a decision as she is deceived and then she gives to her husband to eat with her as well, 1 Timothy chapter 2. The serpent said in verse 4 to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took up its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. When you look to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, you see that, you see that love is, is going to shine through when you get down to verse 15. Sin enters the world, but, but here's God's love. God's love remains for them. In verse 15, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. So even though Adam and Eve had messed up, even though they did wrong, here's, here's God now revealing the, the first part of his plan to them, to mankind. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, you, you, you have to be punished as you read in this chapter. We can't, we can't go on like it was. You, you, you chose to, to do wrong, so, so, so now we, things have to change. But the love of God, I'm going to provide a way. This is his scheme of redemption. Over the next few chapters, you see that, that the world becomes consumed by sin, and yet love continues once again. Love remains once again. In Genesis chapter 4, and verse 8, with, with the children of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. You see one taking the life of the other. And what I, what I hope you'll see throughout this, again, we're, we're highlighting certain points up until the 22nd chapter of Genesis. We're highlighting certain points. And, and then we're going to take it into the New Testament. What I want us to see is God's interaction with man 
Man continually choosing to go down the wrong path and God continuing to provide a way. And with, with the first children, the first siblings, Cain and Abel, one takes the life of the other. Cain, Cain takes his brother's life. That's, how sad is that? When you stop and you think about what's going on in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. It's not on the screen, I don't think, but if you look back to verse 7, God said to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. Think of what God is saying to Cain right before he takes the life of his brother in verse 8. He's telling Cain, look, sin is lying at the door, and that's, that's true for all of us. It's lying at the door. It's there. It wants you. It wants to take your life. It wants to take your family. It wants you to, to, to follow it, Satan and his influences. But God says you can rule over it. You can choose not to do it if you want to. Cain, unfortunately, did not make the right decision. When you get to chapter 6 after the genealogy accounts, you see that by that time, as you're getting into the days of Noah in verse 5, the world is only evil continually. Seems like a good time to give up. Seems like a good time to stop. It seems like a good time to say no more. But verse 8, thankfully, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We, we oftentimes, I want to be careful how I say this, with, without Jesus, of course, we would be nothing. We cannot be saved from our sins. But have you ever thought about without Noah? What, what, what if Noah would not have chosen, verse 8, to find grace in the eyes of the Lord while he was living in a world that was only evil continually? In the days of building the ark, preacher of righteousness, as Peter would tell us, no one else wanted to do what was right, save that of the eight people who went into the ark. All people who have ever lived, all people living now, all people who will ever live, we can all trace our family line through two people. We can all go through Noah, and we can all go back to Adam. That's, that's all people who's ever, who's ever lived. What if there would not have been a Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord when the world was only evil continually? You can, you can be faithful even when no one... I'm thankful to look in to a building of faithful people. I know we have sister congregations all over the world of faithful people. That's, that's encouraging to me. And, and I want to say this in, with love and respect because I know you're faithful. And I don't want to uh, say this with pride, but you know, if we're living in the days of Noah, I want to be the one that gets in the boat, even if everyone else chooses not to. I want to try to encourage others to do the same. But I want my faith to be so strong that I say, God, I will do what you tell me to do. You go through the, through the flood account and you get to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 7 and God tells Noah to do the same thing that he told Adam and Eve to do. To be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. This is the, the scheme of redemption. There's no need for redemption. There's no need for Jesus if there's not people in this world. And now for, it's kind of like a restart, right? Starting over. What is it? I think, what, 1600 years I think since the beginning, since the creation that the flood comes or maybe when they exit the boat perhaps. But what do you see? God, God said, start over. Let's do it again. Fill the world. Scheme of redemption. When you get to Genesis chapter 12, you see a, a new plan. Now, this isn't that God would get to this point and change his mind because, again, we're keeping in mind where we are in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. The plan was all the way there. It was always there. But, but, but we're, we're, we're focusing through on the highlights of, of, of this plan of God. You see, you see a new plan. From Gen Genesis 12 is a natural transition of the book. And from this point forward, the rest of the book, really the rest of the Old Testament, is about the descendants of Abraham. From time to time, you have different people filtered in. The, the people of Edom, which they're descendants of Abraham, just not descendants of uh, Jacob. But you have uh, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Philistines. So you have other people filtered in. But the primary focus for the rest of the Old Testament and carrying us into the New Testament, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, is this plan, this promise that God... Genesis 12, verse 1, gave to Abram. We, we know his name is Abraham. That's when his name is changed later in this book. Now the Lord had said 
to Abram in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We see the promise here of Abraham becoming a great nation. Many people coming from him. The Old Testament people of Israel. That's the descendants of Abraham. But also Matthew chapter 1 that we'll get to eventually. Jesus, a descendant of Abraham. All the families being blessed. I want to notice with you as we think about this covenant that God is making with Abraham. Look to the book of Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1 beginning. God has a new beginning, a new plan. And in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, or Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house was my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body. He shall be your heir. This is all key to understanding the plan of redemption, the scheme of redemption. In verse 5, he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, for he accounted it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth, the Chaldeans, to give you this land to inherit it. He's reminding Abraham of his promise in this new plan. Now I'm going, I'm going to give it to you. The problem that you have in these chapters is Abraham and Sarah, they're not patient. They're not willing to wait on God's promises. They think God needs a little help with his plan in doing it their way rather than God's way. Genesis chapter 17 is key in this study, the scheme of redemption. The sign of the covenant. The sign of the covenant. I'll probably say this again, but let me say it now. If you're interested in going back and spending a little more time with this lesson, what you would want to do is read Genesis chapters 12 through 22. And then you would want to read Galatians chapters 3 and 4. You can never understand Galatians chapters 3 and 4 if you do not read Genesis chapters 12 through 22. And that's what what we're talking about here. That's what we're just, this plan, you see this this sign of a new covenant, Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and he said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Notice verse 2. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. God said, I will make my covenant. God's extending his covenant to Abraham. God is extending his uh, promise, his plan to Abraham. It is God's covenant. He lays the terms and the conditions. And he says to Abraham, here it is. But then Abraham, who's called a friend of God throughout the Bible, must choose if he is going to be a part of this covenant or not. The same is true when you get to the book of Exodus with the people of Israel. God's extending a covenant to them. But in return, they must choose if they're going to obey him or not. If they obey all the blessings in the world, being a part of God's family. Not that everything goes exactly the way we want it to go all the time, but all of the blessings of the world, certainly in eternity. Same is true in New Testament Christianity. It's God's covenant. It's God's plan. He is offering it to us. We don't get to set the terms and the conditions. We're the ones who need a path back to God. And the scheme of redemption is what provides that path back. In the rest of this chapter, you see that the sign of this covenant was circumcision. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. To circumcise the male children on the eighth day, you see that established again in the next period of time, the mosaical period of time with the law of Moses. Circumcision of the male child. 
file that away in the back of your mind. It's going to be very important when we get to the end of our sermon a little later this morning. In Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, you see Abraham doing what God told him to do. His son, his male son, Isaac, is born, and Abraham circumcises him in the first four verses. It's not on our PowerPoint this morning, but you would want to include Genesis chapter 22. And that is where Abraham's faith is tested. And I want to make just one comment about that. As you know, and you've read the first 13 verses of Genesis 22 many, many times, Abraham takes his son, his only son Isaac. Now he has other children. We've already read that. But this is the son of promise. That's why he's called his only son. This is the son of promise. Again, Galatians chapters 3 and 4 are going to bear that out. But Abraham is told to go and offer him. He rises early in the morning to do so, a three-day journey. Isaac's with him. Isaac is old enough to understand what's going on. He's carrying some of what is needed for the sacrifice, and he even asks, Where, where's, where's, the, where's the sacrifice? We have everything needed, so you have to appreciate the faith of Isaac also, all the way up to the point of Abraham is about to go through with it when God stops him. Here's the point I want to make. A ram took the place of Isaac in Genesis 22. No ram, no lamb, no animal took the place of Jesus. When he went to the cross to give himself as a sacrifice, no one else could go. Nothing else could go. All of the animals of the world could not go. Nothing took the place of Jesus when he gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. You pick up the next period of time in the book of Exodus with Moses the lawgiver. And from that point forward, you have the descendants of Abraham, the nation of Israel. You have them with the law that was given to them, all a part of God's plan, the scheme of redemption. But we need to fast forward to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah is an Old Testament book among the major prophets after the book of Psalms, one of the longer books, 52 chapters. If you get to the shorter books of the minor prophets, you went a little too far, you have to go back a few books. It's right near Isaiah Jeremiah chapter 31. This is, again, when we're talking about the overall scheme of redemption. I know I've already said that. I have to remember this. This is another one that we need to remember. Jeremiah, living in today's captivity, also the Mosaical period of time, the Jewish period of time, they're not under the covenant given to Abraham. That time ended. Okay. Now the promise continues, but they're under the covenant given to Moses. They have the tabernacle and all that goes along with that. By this time they have the temple. They're under that covenant. That which started when they were in the wilderness on Mount Sinai. And Jeremiah said at that time in chapter 31 and verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Notice the future tense. The days are coming, not now. But future tense. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant, here's your past tense, to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. We talk about the scheme of redemption. Here's, here's Jeremiah prophesying that a time will come when we will not remain under this covenant that we are currently under, the law of Moses and all that would go along with that. You see the plan being fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1. Jesus is a descendant of Abraham when you read that chapter. And he said, I, I've come to fulfill. I didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets, but I've come to fulfill. For time's sake, let's move ahead to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to move ahead to Hebrews chapter 7. I want to notice how now all of this, this plan is fulfilled. All of this plan has come uh, uh, full circle. All that we talked about in this scheme of redemption and God's plan, Jesus fulfilled it, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. The book of Hebrews is 13 chapters, and it's all about, you probably have heard many times, Christ being better. Better than Moses, 
His law is better than the law of Moses. His plan, his way is better than that way. Not that it's against it, it's a part of it. It came out of it. That's what we're looking at. But I would suggest to you also, a, 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 if, if you want that to be your, your major theme, here's your minor theme. Change. Change. That's what the Hebrews writer is trying to get across to these Christians who are of the Hebrew family. Look, it's changed. We're no longer under that old covenant. We're no longer under that old law. We don't need to bring part of it into where we are today, nor do we need to go back into it. In particular, you notice a change of the priesthood in chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. A change of the law in chapter 8. A change of the sacrifice in chapter 9. A change of the covenants, just the same. Notice Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. The Hebrews writer is recalling the covenant that they were under with Moses, the tabernacle and the priesthood. He said, look, all this has changed. By the way, if it remained, if it did continue then Jesus could never be our high priest because he was not a descendant of Aaron. He was not a descendant of Levi. He was a descendant of Judah. And under that law, he could not be the high priest. Chapter 8, I want to notice the bookends, verses 6 and 13. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, But now he has attained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Verse 13, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete now that which is obsolete is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. And if you glance to your Bible in verses 8 through 12, you'll see that maybe the words are in all caps or bold or italics. If you just do a quick glance at it, you'll notice the Hebrews writer is quoting what we just read in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. What the Hebrews writer is doing is saying, look, Jeremiah... Our prophet told us about this. The days are coming in Jeremiah's time. And the Hebrews writer is now saying the days have come. We're here. This is all part of the scheme of redemption. As I've mentioned a number of times, you see this being fulfilled in Abraham and Jesus in Galatians chapters 3 and 4. I want to mention just a couple of passages from these two chapters in Galatians chapters 3 and 4 you have to read all of both chapters to see how this ties in to the first 22 chapters of Genesis but notice verse 26 for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek there's neither slave nor free there's neither male nor female for you're all one in Christ Jesus and if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise stop and let that sink in the day that you were baptized into Christ, you chose to be a recipient of a promise that was made to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. And God's plan being fulfilled all the way through the days of Abraham's descendants, the people of Israel, Christ coming, Christ dying. That's why we can be saved. That's God's plan of redemption. That's the scheme of redemption. You notice he talks in the first four verses of Galatians chapter 4 of the bond woman and the free woman. How the promise came through Isaac, not Ishmael. And you get down to verse 21 of Galatians chapter 4. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise. What, what is God confirming here? Tied together. Ephesians 1, 4 through 7, Galatians chapter 4. God had a plan before the foundation of the world. God's plan through Abraham ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus. Well, let's, let's conclude our sermon. Let's close our sermon by going to Colossians chapter 2. And talk about this, this new birth. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we're born into the family of God. Water baptism. We just read that in Galatians 3, 27. But I, I want to make our closing comment from Colossians chapter 2. 
Remember a little while ago I said, remember this. File it away. We're going to go back to it. Colossians chapter 2 ties in directly to Genesis chapter 17. The Bible is like this. It's 66 books that stand alone, but they also all work together. And they all fit together. Part of God's plan. Genesis chapter 17, God told Abraham to circumcise his male children. We don't have to do that today. We're not under Abraham's covenant. We're not under the covenant that was given to Moses, the lawgiver for the people of Israel. We don't have to do that today. We're not under that covenant. But notice how God used it throughout the history of time to give us the covenant that we're under. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Notice that. Without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. In which you also were raised with him through faith in the working God who raised him from the dead. Only God... Only God can have a plan before he even created the world that would include all of this that would tie together circumcision and baptism. Only God can do that and have it fulfilled over the history of the world. God's plan to redeem man. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of court requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That's the part that we skipped in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. It was when Jesus died that he did away with the old law. That's what we're reading in Colossians 2, 14, to give us the new law, the new way, the new plan. All of this is part of God's plan, God's scheme of redemption. Shannon is going to get ready to come and lead us in a song of encouragement. And I want you to think about it. I know we went through a lot of verses in a little amount of time. But I I, I wanted, I hope, maybe to hit the highlights to cause us to go back. But ultimately, right now, when in a moment we stand together to sing to one another, I want you to think about how special you are to God. A predetermined plan that He executed perfectly through his people that you and I are the recipients of today because there's still a final chapter. There's one chapter that's not been written and that's the Lord's return. That's when it's all over here. It's all done. And it's eternity, heaven or hell. If you this morning are not a child of God as we've read a number of times in the Bible, please become one. Putting on Christ in baptism as a believer, repenting of your sins, or returning to God, just asking for forgiveness if you are a baptized believer. We'd love to help you to go to heaven. What a joy it is to think about God's plan for you. If you need to respond in faithful obedience this morning, please come as we stand and as we sing.